behalf of the Arts Alliance of Greater Lake Mills and the LD Fargo Public Library, I would like to welcome you, welcome you here this evening to hear renowned writer Parker Palmer speak about his recently published book, Healing the Heart of Democracy. So Leslie gave me a, a lovely introduction and whenever I, I hear such an introduction, um, there's a story that always comes to mind. It's about my mother who died at age 93 a few years back and really spent the last decade of her life terribly, terribly worried about how or in fact whether I was making a living. Um, <laughs> I understood this because um, I, have, I don't work for an institution, I don't report to an office, I don't have a title. Um, I have a P.O. box in Madison. I have a five-second commute from my bedroom to my office <laughs> you know, where I usually stay in my bathrobe and pajamas and slippers until my wife comes in at lunchtime and says, get a life, take a shower, <laughs> act like a grown-up. And um, so I, under I was sympathetic, you know, with my mom who couldn't understand um, why I hadn't had a real job like my dad and I think was probably worried that I was going to move into her basement at some point. <laughs> so this one time down in Chicago when I was visiting her, she was probably 88 or 89, she said, now please tell me very clearly this time, Parker, how it is you make your living. I'm worried and I have a number of friends who are worried as well. So I said, well, mom, let me try to boil it down. So I spend a lot of time at home writing books and articles, maybe half my time, in an effort to talk with people on the printed page about things I care about. And then sometimes people read those books and articles and they'll invite me to give a talk or a workshop or a retreat at, at a school or a church or a, uh, an institution of some sort. And, and so that's how I make my living. I, I, there's really not a lot more I can say about it. And, she thought for a minute, I can see her now sitting in that wing chair with her cane planted <laughs> firmly in the rug, looking for all the world like the queen of Romania. And um, she said, all right, so you're telling me you make your living by talking with people. Is that correct, Parker? And I, I said, Yes, that's a fair summary, Mom. I, I make my living by talking with people. She thought for a moment and said, well, I don't mind talking with you, Parker, but I certainly wouldn't pay for it. <laughs> so, <laughs> when you get a nice introduction, you know, it's good to hear your mother's voice in, in your other ear. So, with that, and I should also warn you, these are new reading glasses, so I have no idea how this is going to go tonight. I'm, not adjusted to this yet, but let me plunge into my topic as best I know how. I want to talk for a little while and then open it up for dialogue, which is always the part that I like the best. So everyone knows that our political system is not working very well. That's no news to anyone in this room. It often seems downright dysfunctional. I think one big piece of evidence for that claim is that there are significant gaps between reputable public opinion polls, such as those done by Pew Research, on a range of issues and decisions that are being made in Washington, D.C. A big gap between how the public would like think to see things in this country, either by small or larger majorities, and the decisions or, that are being made or not made in relation to those issues. I'm, th I'm thinking, having just looked at some of the Pew Research Center data, about such things as protecting the environment, which most Americans want to have more done about, um, reducing our overseas military commitments, improving veteran benefits and services, maintaining or strengthening restrictive gun control laws, providing a way for undocumented immigrants uh, to gain legal citizenship, 
legalizing civil unions for same-sex couples, establishing more progressive tax policies, etc. But those majority opinions are not well represented in, our, in centers of decision making in our government, either at the national or state level. It is as if many people in power are operating on signals from another planet. And most of us know the name of that planet, big money, big money. Um, let me steal a line from Bill Moyers, whom I admire not only for his political courage, but for his honest journalism. He said, the antidote, the only antidote to the power of organized money is the power of organized people. The antidote, the only antidote to the power of organized money is the power of organized people. I like that line not only because I think it's true, I can't think of another countervailing force to big money other than us, you and me, uh, but also because it takes us back to the words that launched this nation into being, the first words of the Constitution of the United States. We the people, we the people of the United States in order to form a more perfect union. Now we all know, it's Civics 101, that we the people are foundational to American democracy. But the question I want to explore tonight is how much attention do we pay to the strength of this foundation, which uh, is a secret hidden in plain sight? And in my estimation, the answer is nowhere near enough. Um, I'd say, in fact, that the foundation of American democracy called we the people, or the infrastructure of our democratic system of government, is in serious disrepair these days. And in ways I want to explore with you this evening, it's my belief that that if, is, if not the root, a major root of our political pathologies. Now, one piece of evidence that intrigues me a lot for the claim I just made is the simple act of listening to ourselves talk about politics. Listen in on our own political discourse. Listen the next time you get together with friends or the next time you're at a meeting of a voluntary association uh, or any kind of citizen gathering where ostensibly the topic is American politics. Almost all of it, in, in my hearing, is about them, those power holders in distant places at whom we love to throw brickbats or bouquets, depending on which side of the aisle we sit on. Them, those people who are largely beyond our reach, them, those people who make decisions behind closed doors. And the net result of this is a political discourse among we the people, which is inherently disempowering. Inherently disempowering. Look at it this way. Our political discourse almost always is about people who aren't in the room, right? When was the last time talking about people who aren't in the room fixed anything? <laughs> I, I'm not aware that that is helpful very often. It reminds me of the church I grew up in where the preacher, Sunday after Sunday, or at least with great frequency, would talk about all those people who were out on the golf course instead of in church. and it, I kind of started wondering why I ought to be there. Maybe I ought to be out on the golf course so that I would be the focus of his interest. Um, <laughs> in later years, I came to believe that he was actually projecting a desire to be out on the golf course himself, which reminds me of a joke. Oh, excuse me. 
this happens at my age, so you'll have to check me every now and then. But it's about the, uh, the son who gets up in the morning on Sunday and comes downstairs and says to his mother, Mother, I'm not going to church this morning, and I have two reasons. I don't like those people, and they don't like me. And his mother said, son, you are going to church this morning, and I have two reasons. You're 52 years old, and you're their minister. <laughs> so, I'm just saying. Uh, we need to start talking about us, not them, the people who are in the room, because that's something we can do something about. We need to start talking about us in a way that will help us reweave and rebuild this civic community called We the People. But there's a nameable reason, I think, why that conversation is hard and doesn't get turned to very often. We the People tend to be at each other's throats these days unable ourselves to talk across our lines of difference, political, ideological, religious, racial, ethnic, class differences. We have a terribly difficult time talking with folks who don't agree with us, who don't come from a shared background or a shared perspective sometimes who simply don't look like us, no matter what they may think. We don't slow down long enough to find out what they think. We have a terribly difficult time talking across our own lines of difference in ways that even vaguely resemble civil discourse. And when civil discourse does not exist, we the people don't exist. We the people don't exist simply because somebody waves a wand called the Constitution and declares us to be real. In every generation, we have the job of making ourselves real. And the fundamental job, I think, is cultivating a civil discourse across deep lines of difference. I'm going to spend some time this evening digging further into that claim, but I want to make it clear as I do so that I think the conversation about civil discourse in this country has been watered down to a point where it's essentially meaningless. I think when most people hear that phrase, civil discourse, they think it has something to do with watching our tongues, right? They think it has something to do with a sort of mismanners approach to conversation as if, as we say in the Midwest, we simply need to make nice on each other. And if somebody disagrees, we might go as far as saying, well, that's different, but not much more. That's not what I'm talking about. Civil discourse, I think, has, is not fundamentally rooted in watching our tongues. Civil discourse will come when we <coughs> learn to actively value our differences. Civil discourse will come only when we learn to actively value our differences, to actually approach difference rather than avoid it, because we understand that the only way we learn and grow as individuals or as a society is through the encounter of conflicting ideas held in a, respectfully in a way that allows us to listen to one another, to find points of consensus, however few, and slowly grope our way toward a rough notion of what is in the common good, a phrase that we don't hear much these days. I, I can't think of a field of human endeavor um, from the writing of history to the development of high technology where it hasn't been the respectful conflict of diverse viewpoints, business, 
religion, whatever, health in any of these arenas of human endeavor has come from the respectful holding of human differences and the emergence of a larger view than any parties to that contest held before the dialogue began. Only as we do that can we come together as a civic community able to exercise the power of organized people as a, as a countermand to the power of organized money, able to hold our elected officials accountable to the, the people's will. Uh, it, public opinion polls may give us statistics on what the American consensus looks like, but it's very hard to find that embodied or represented in actual on-the-ground conversations across our country today. Now, I'm not an idealist about this. I'm prepared to grant at the outset that 15 to 20 percent of the people on the far right and 15 to 20 percent of the people on the far left w will probably be unable to engage the kind of respectful dialogue that I have in mind. But do the math. That still leaves 60 to 70 percent in the middle who can have that conversation, have a potential for that conversation, and in a democracy that's more than enough to do business, that 60 to 70 percent in the middle. Now let me turn toward a little American history. It's very important to realize that sharp differences between us are nothing new, that they aren't the product of an increasingly diverse society or of some special toxin that's being introduced into our groundwater and reservoirs at this point in the American journey. For one piece of, simple piece of evidence, let me cite the Constitutional Convention of 1787. 30 percent, or a little more than 30 percent, of the delegates to that convention walked out saying a pox on all your houses, refusing to sign the document. I'm willing to bet that their descendants are pretty ticked off at them because the family name isn't, isn't there. And speaking of families, that 30 percent figure when I discovered it in doing research for this book I, was one that I found very reassuring because 30 percent is about this proportion of people in my own family with whom I have difficulty talking <laughs> politics, which, which really means I have an all-American family. You know, I had to join the Daughters of the American Revolution or something because that's the American way. Our problems are not rooted in the fact that we are now a diverse nation, raci racially, ethnically, religiously, and so forth. How could they be rooted in that fact when the founders of this country were as alike as peas in a pod? The only people they took seriously were white, male, landed gentry. For the founders, that's who we the people equaled. And, and, and yet, among, among that group of folks who were as alike as peas in a pod, there was tremendous difference of opinion as to how to handle this dilemma with England and the emergence of a new nation and the presence of states and the contest with federal powers. The genius of the founders that in ways I want to name in a minute counterbalanced the bigotry and ignorance that made them think only people who looked like themselves were worthy. The genius of the founders was to establish a system of government that was able to hold their differences and our differences in perpetuity. That was the intent of the fundamental structures of American 
government. This was opened up for me by a historian named Joseph Ellis, who has written a book that I think is an important book called American Creation. And in that book, there's a brief section where he, he says, a, he writes a sentence or two that opened my mind to a new way of looking at things. He says, the, the government of the United States, the structures of the government of the United States were not created in order to answer questions or solve problems. They were created to keep the salient questions and the important problems on the table over time long enough that we could keep coming back and back and back to them for better and better answers, right? In other words, this is, this is a vision of, in which the answers are not as important as the holding of the questions. And, the, and every answer is regarded as provisional until, uh, until it gets sifted and winnowed, to, to use the great language of the University of Wisconsin and the whole land-grant enterprise, in a next iteration of insight and understanding. The American political system, here's my way of looking at it, at the same thing from a slightly different angle. The American political system is a unique historical breakthrough because as far as I know, for the first time in history, a government was established that treats tension and conflict not as the enemy of a better social order, but as the engine of a better social order. Prior to this model of government, hammered out in the heat of disagreement among the founders, there was a very simple answer to tension and conflict in a society. Princes, potentates, and popes would simply quash it. End of story. You get a better social order by, by suppressing, even killing off, the dissenters. That was the way you held on to the order, the orthodoxy, and the power that was threatened by dissent. But here's a system of government where the dissent among the people who put the system together was so great that the only way they could get out of the room was to create structures such as the tripartite division that we're all so familiar with, tension holding structures, structures that I see, the image I have is a loom that holds the threads of a society in a way that allows us to keep weaving and reweaving the, the fabric of our common life over time in a way that actually values tension and conflict as a source of energy for change. The same source that I was talking about earlier in every field of human endeavor. And the acid test of that, I think, is that among among many other things, we could name all kinds of issues that have been held and woven and rewoven by this loom of government. But look at the simple fact that the founders created a system of government that was able to overcome their own bigotry about who is to be included in we the people. So that imperfectly, of course, and with a lot of work yet to do, Native Americans, women, enslaved human beings, people who don't hold own property, became included in that great notion of we the people. It is an act of genius to create a system that can check and correct your own idiocy. That is an act of genius. And, and that is an act of intellectual and I would even say spiritual vulnerability to put something together that, that you can't stand at the levers of in perpetuity and, and make it do your dance, but that holds tension in a way that invites other voices into that conversation and checks and corrects your own narrowness of mind or pinched quality of heart. 
That seems to me to be an act of political, intellectual, and as I say, spiritual genius. I'll just say one more word about this because I think this is an understanding that is at the that, that is so important to embrace as we as we walk around in a society that's full of conflict and, and live in a time when instead of instead of valuing that and, and, and moving toward it, we run away from it. We flee into the solitude of our own private lives. We hang out with people who look and think and act and believe like us. We, we aren't in the spirit with which the founders brought this country into being, however unwittingly they, they did that. So one more word about that. It's very important to remember the fact that in our society there is no final solution and thank God for that. We all know what the, where the phrase the final solution comes from. It comes from an evil form of an evil fascism which needed not simply to quash dissent, but to find scapegoats. It goes on yet today for the problems that nobody knows how to solve, to blame those people, to marginalize them, and obviously in the case of Nazi Germany to murder at least six million, probably more like 12 or 13 million of those people. Um, there is no final solution in American democracy. There is only the ongoing holding of tension and engagement with tension, and thank God for that. So we have this tension holding structure, but 60 years after this country was founded in the 1830s, there arrives on American shores a remarkable young Frenchman named Alexis de Tocqueville. Uh, his, his story is worth knowing a little bit about. For, for, among other things, he was only 27 years old when he went back to France after just a year in this young country um, and wrote what is arguably the best book still ever written on the things I'm talking about tonight called Democracy in America. Tocqueville was the fellow who started helping Americans understand that while they had a system of government that was indeed a work of genius, a tension-holding system that he deeply valued because he and his family barely survived the French Revolution and the suppression of conflict and dissent. Um, while we had a system that he valued and we needed to value, the system alone would not work if it were not inhabited by leaders and citizens who had what he called democratic habits of the heart. Habits of the heart. Tocqueville was the guy who more than anybody else helped us understand that our political life, like every other aspect of human life, has an external visible dimension to it and an equally important internal invisible dimension to it. Habits of the heart was the concept that he worked with, but he didn't work with it in a mystical way. He talked about what it, what it is that goes on in the very local venues of our lives, not with them out there far away in distant places, but at home, in our families, among our friends, in our neighborhoods, in our classrooms, in our workplaces, in our religious communities, in the spaces of public life. You have a wonderful one right in the middle of downtown here, the, the, the village square. It's not a square, it's a village triangle or something. I don't know, I drove around it, but 
it's neat and it's to be treasured. Um, that it's a space where the company of strangers can gather. And Tocqueville was very, very observant about how it is that in these close at hand places, these local venues of life where, in, through which we move day in and day out, our hearts are either formed or deformed in terms of what it takes to be a citizen in a democracy. He, he drew our attention to the fact that, that we, the people, on a daily basis have to be asking ourselves important questions about what's going on in our families and what's going on between us and our friends and who are our friends and what's happening in our neighborhoods and our classrooms and workplaces and congregations that either lends itself to the challenges of a democracy or deforms people into um, becoming good subjects of autocratic rule but not fit citizens for a democratic society. He brought this home, he, he, and, and he saw the dance that had to be done between the genius of our governmental structures and the formation or deformation of the human heart. So democracy's infrastructure, for me, is the habits of the heart and those local venues in which they get formed or deformed. And the bad news about that is that this is what's in disrepair. Because we're always talking about them and, and all of the externals of our political dilemmas, we, we aren't concentrating, focused, working uh, nearly hard enough on what is close at hand, what is within our reach, who is in the room, and what's happening between us that either does or does not collaborate with the genius of the political structures, and the, that either does or does not challenge those points at which those political structures are manipulated in a way that fails to live up to, to the norms that the founders clearly had in mind when they were established, that, that, that undermines the tension-holding function of, those government, uh, of the government. I mean, decision-making behind closed doors is a classic example of um, secrecy, lack of transparency in public information, filibustering that keeps a legislative body from even debating issues, um, filling hearing rooms with stooges who are paid $5 an hour to just sit there so that people who want to argue with the proposal being made can't even get into the room. These are all ways of undermining the tension-holding structures of government, but Tocqueville would also insist that it's even closer to home in terms of how you're raising your children, how you're relating to your neighbors, how you're teaching your students, what's going on in religious congregations that forms or deforms the heart. So the bad news is that, in my judgment anyway, this is what's in disrepair because we haven't been attending to it, preferring to externalize our problems and look elsewhere for their, not so much for their solutions as just for a way of nattering on about them, which is how much of our political discourse sounds to me. But the good news is that restoring that infrastructure is work we can do day in and day out, not waiting for the next election cycle or the next hot button issue to come along to get politically engaged, not thinking about flying off to D.C. or marching on the state capitol, as valuable as that may be from time to time, to try to engage people who are beyond our reach, not spending all our time talking about them, but 
engaging in constructive talk and action about us, about ourselves, about you and me. So let me turn finally to the question that's hanging in the air, which is what might some of that talk and action look like? How might we think about and work with these habits of the heart? I want to read this quote from Terry Tempest Williams because it's such a poetic way of saying what Alexis de Tocqueville had in mind before we look at five particular habits of the heart that I think are important. The human heart, she says, is the first home of democracy. It is where we embrace our questions. Can we be equitable? Can we be generous? Can we listen with our whole beings, not just our minds, and offer our attention rather than our opinions? And do we have enough resolve in our hearts to act courageously, relentlessly, without giving up ever, trusting our fellow citizens to join with us in our determined pursuit of a living democracy? I think Tocqueville, de Tocqueville would have loved that quote a lot, a couple of reasons. She's using the word heart in the same way he used it, which is the classical use of the word heart. Not, not just meaning the seat of the emotions, not just meaning feelings or affect, but heart from the Latin core, C-O-R, pointing to the C-O-R-E of the human self, that place in us where all of our faculties for knowing and acting converge, not just feeling, but intellect, intuition, will, relational knowledge, problem-solving capacity, the whole kielbasa, as we would say in Wisconsin. So heart here is not to be understood as an emotional reductionism about our problems, but rather as an invocation for Terry Tempest Williams and for Alexis de Tocqueville of the whole human self. Politics is a full body engagement, I think is one way of saying it. A second thing to be noted with care in this quote is that Terry Tempest Williams is not saying that the heart has an irresistible tropism toward democracy. On the contrary, she's saying the heart is where we battle out which way we're going, which way we want to go as individuals. The heart is where we hold these questions that are so critical in, in American democratic life. Can we be equitable? Can we be generous? Can we listen, offer our attention rather than our opinions? Do we have enough resolve to not give up on each other ever? to weave a community of trust even when the going gets rough? Those are big questions. So if the human heart is not the home of democracy, it is at least the first forum where questions of great moment get held and answered for better or for worse. And each of us has a job to do examining our own hearts to get honest with ourselves and with those close to us about how we are holding those questions.